Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session on preparing and submitting a successful proposal to one of the mission calls that have been discussed this morning and will be also discussed uh, during the day tomorrow. My name is Franz Simler. I work uh, as a head of sector in the executive agency CINEA, which is one of the three, ex uh, three executive agencies tasked with uh, implementing, actually, the mission calls. So running the evaluation and um, later the preparing grant agreements and monitoring the activities. Um, we in CINEA, we will implement the mission on cities, on oceans and on climate, while the soil mission will be implemented in the other executive agency called REA, Research Executive Agency, and the cancer mission in Hadia. Um, I will guide you through this session this afternoon and will be supported by my colleague Octavia Stepan, who is also working in CINEA and she will be moderating or from the background the Slido Q&A session. So we encourage you please to ask questions for that. Follow hashtag missionsinfoday on slido.com where you can enter your questions. So we will have three presentations and after each um, after each, you have uh, the opportunity to ask directly questions to the speaker. Okay. And we start with our first speaker, who is Isabel Vergada Ogando. She works in the Common Implementation Center here in DGRTD. And she will present you the novelties in the submission and evaluation process in Horizon Europe and in particularly for the missions. Please, Isabel. We don't hear you, I think. mission and evaluation process in Horizon Europe. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, okay, we hear you. Go ahead. Isabel, we hear you. Yes, Isabel, I hear you. But uh, I'm not sure if I should start or not. Or not. Yes, please go ahead, Isabel. Okay. Okay, thank you, Franz. Yeah. Um, yes, so as I mentioned, um, I will start with uh, the novelties in the submission and evaluation process in Horizon Europe. Now we don't hear you anymore. Seem to be some technical hiccups. Sorry for that. We don't hear you, Isabel. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we hear you. Okay, thank you. I don't know why, why I unmuted without doing anything, but uh, you muted without doing anything. Uh, sorry for the problem. So um, I was mentioning that uh, uh, I will start uh, the presentation with the novelties in the submission process. I will continue presenting the, the novelties in the evaluation process. And then I will finalize with the most important things that uh, the proposers need to take into account when writing uh, the proposals. Uh, the presentation that I am going to present now is general for all Horizon Europe, in particular for, for missions and for Pillar 2, um, uh, for the Pillar 2 uh, calls in Horizon Europe. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Okay, now, yeah, sorry. Um, so, about the admissibility and eligibility criteria, um, you have uh, published in the general annexes of the work program complete information about what are the standard uh, admissibility and eligibility criteria that uh, apply to most of the goals in Horizon Europe. You also need to read carefully the conditions of the topic that, uh, that you want to submit your proposal because it may include additional admissibility and eligibility conditions. And I am presenting in these slides what are the novelties in comparison with uh, Horizon 2020. So one of the novelties that we have included is that we have substantially reduced the maximum length of a proposal. So here you have the standard uh, limit uh, in, in terms of pages. 
that you can submit. This is about pages in the part B of the proposal. And the standard limits are for RIAs and EAs 45 pages, for CSAs 30 pages. I think these are the two um, or the three uh, type of actions that are included in the mission calls. Uh, however, I have seen exceptions in the mission calls, in particular for the mission on uh, climate, if I am not mistaken. So uh, please check uh, for exceptions to this uh, standard uh, page limit. Uh, we have also some uh, novelties about uh, the consortium composition in this type of actions, in RIAS, EAS uh, in particular. And uh, for RIAS and EAS, uh, we, we need at least one independent legal entity established in a member state and at least two other independent legal entities uh, each established either in a different member state or an associated country. So in Horizon Europe, we need at, at least one of three uh, minimum uh, countries be a member state. And then in addition for CSAs, um, this, uh, if not otherwise specified in the topic conditions, um, may be submitted by one or more legal entities which are established in a member state or associated country. And again, only if included in the topic conditions, other countries can also participate as beneficiaries. And then we have um, another novelty, uh, uh, which is that we are requesting a gender equality plan for all participants that are public bodies, research organizations, or higher edu education establishment, established in a member states or associated countries. So um, uh, for doing this, for checking us, uh, for checking this uh, in the submission and evaluation of the proposal, you will need to go to the participant registration and tick in our organization database whether your organization has a gender equality plan. If this is not flagged, then of course we will admit the proposal for evaluation. It will be evaluated, but if the proposal is invited to GAP, then during GAP we will not be able to sign a grant agreement if uh, there is there are participants, public bodies, research organizations, or higher education establishments that do not have uh, gender equality plans. Um, about associated countries, so I give you the status of today. So we have um, already a number of countries which associations has started to take effect. You have the list here. And we have another um, group of countries in, for which we are still uh, negotiate, negotiating the association agreement. Um, for those countries, for this in the second group, um, we will consider as associated countries in, uh, in the phase of submission and evaluation, but uh, we will not be able to sign grant agreements until the association agreement takes effect with those countries. So if, um, if participants from the to-be-associated countries participate as beneficiaries in proposals, so um, in GAP, we will have to wait until the negotiation agreement with the country is, uh, is uh, taking effect. The specific situation with Switzerland, I believe you are all aware, is that legal entities established in Switzerland in Switzerland are currently not covered by this transitional agreement. So uh, Switzerland is a third country uh, for the time being uh, in Horizon Europe. Um, for activities eligible for funding, uh, there are no changes in comparison with Horizon 2020, but I would like to remind uh, what are these activities that are not eligible for funding, and uh, those are those that are not focused exclusively on civil applications, and then we cannot fund activities that aim at human cloning for, for reproductive purposes intend to modify the genetic heritage of human beings with some exceptions for uh, cancer treatments of the gonads, um, intend to create human embryos solely for the purpose of research and lead to the destruction of human embryos. So these activities cannot be funded in Horizon Europe. Uh, then I will also would like to mention uh, the structure of the application form. 
um, which is, keeps the same structure as in Horizon Europe. So the proposal includes two main parts, the part A and the part B. The part A is a web-based form, so these are questions that you need to answer directly in the IT tool, in the submission tool. And the part B is the narrative part um, that you have to upload to the submission system as a PDF uh, document. Uh, here you have the link to the uh, standard proposal template that we published in the participant portal. But the template that you have to use is the template that you download from the submission system in the topic that you are submitting your proposal. Because in the portal, in the reference documents, we publish standard templates, but for the specific calls, these templates may uh, have uh, changes that you need to take into account. Um, in this template, uh, of the proposal templates include some novelties. Uh, for instance, we have include, uh, included new fields in the part A. So we ask now about the identity of the researchers. This is the researchers table included in the part A. And here I could like to clarify that we are only uh, asking for the identity of researchers. It's not our intention to ask for the identity of all persons that will work in the proposal. So we are only interested in the identity of the researchers because we need to answer an indicator in Horizon Europe for the whole program, which is um, whether the program influences the uh, career of researchers. Um, so we have received many questions about this table, but um, the answer is that uh, you don't have to include there the identity of all persons included in the proposal that will work in the proposal, but only the researchers. We have also included a new table uh, about um, clarifying what is the role of, the, of each participating organization. And also we include the self-declaration on gender equality plan uh, for the time being, you still need to flag this, uh, this gender equality plan in the proposal, but very soon we will retrieve this information from the uh, participants' database. So you don't have to answer every time that you submit a proposal. We have also moved uh, fields that were before in Horizon 2020 in Part B to the Part A. So part B was uh, narrative in PDF, part A is web-based. And these are the questions that we ask for the ethics self-assessment. We have a new security questionnaire, a few questions that every proposal in Horizon Europe uh, need to answer, and then the information on participants' previous activities related to the call. These are um, questions that before in Horizon 2020 we were asking in part B, now these questions are in part B. And then in part B, um, we have made some changes. So we keep the three sections, three main sections, each corresponding to each uh, one of the evaluation criteria. But we have made a lot of effort to, to include a glossary of terms and ensure that the same terminology is used in all phases of the grant. Um, so from the submission of the proposal until the final reporting if the, if the project is funded. Um, yeah, so this is what I wanted to say here. And um, so I now go to include what are the, to, to mention what are the novelties in the evaluation process. And for this, I would like to mention that um, we keep the same uh, award criteria as in Horizon 2020. So we have uh, three main criteria, excellent impact and quality and efficiency of the implementation. And in Horizon Europe, we keep the same evaluation criteria. However, we have adapted this uh, evaluation criteria based on the lessons learned in Horizon 2020. And what we have done is to reduce the number of experts to be taken into account in each of the evaluation criteria. And we have also ensured that the same aspect is not assessed twice in different evaluation criteria, so we do not penalize 
uh, a proposal uh, twice for the same reason. Another important change in Horizon Europe is that the open science practices are assessed now as part of the scientific methodology, so as part of the excellent criterion. In the past, it was assessed uh, as part of the impact criterion. So uh, also a novelty in Horizon Europe is that we have a completely new approach to impact. This is what we call key impact pathways, and we'll come back with more information later. But um, in, in substance, we have not changed uh, almost anything. So we keep asking the participants to explain what will be the impact of their proposal. What we have tried to, to present in Horizon Europe is a methodology that is valid for all projects and will help the participants to explain how will be uh, the impact or what will be the impact of their proposal. Um, the, access, the assessment of the quality of the applicants is now done under the third criterion, quality and efficiency of the implementation, and not as a separate uh, binary question um, as it was done um, in, um, in Horizon 2020. So here I need to explain that in Horizon 2020, as well as in Horizon Europe, we keep, uh, we assess as part of the evaluation criteria, the quality of the consortium as a whole. But in Horizon 2020, we were asking the experts whether every individual participant had sufficient um, expertise to, to perform the task that they had to perform. So it was not part of the evaluation criteria. It was a question that we were asking for each individual applicant. And if um, the experts dis decided that one particular applicant didn't have sufficient operational capacity, then this applicant could not participate in a funded proposal. So what we have changed in Horizon Europe is that the quality of the individual applicants and also the quality of the consortium is now part of the assessment of the quality and efficiency of the implementation. So it's part of the criterion number three. And then we have also um, removed the assessment of management structures. So this doesn't mean that we are not asking for this information because this is an information that is uh, important to follow up uh, grants, to follow up funded projects. So this information must be included in the proposal normally included in as part of the description of the work package that is related to management, but we will not ask uh, the evaluators to assess the quality of the management structures. Uh, finally, I would go to a number of points that are important and should be considered in all calls in Horizon Europe. So first, I will start with a key principles that summarize all what we are, what I am going to say after. Um, and this probably is a kind of checklist that you need to take into account when preparing your proposal. So the first thing that you need to take into account, and this is in, this is particularly relevant for pillar two calls and for missions, is that. Uh, the proposed work in your proposal must be within the scope of a work program topic. So we uh, open calls, we open topics that are very prescriptive in many cases. So we really uh, tell in the topic what we are looking for, uh, in, in, for in the proposals that will be funded under this topic. And um, this is really important because if you present a very good proposal, but it's not fully in line with what we are asking in our topic, this proposal will not be evaluated well. So uh, it is important that you really need to answer uh, the, the conditions and, and, and all the criteria that we announced in, in the topic. So you also need to demonstrate that your idea is ambitious and goes beyond the state of the art. Uh, when you design your scientific methodology, uh, you must take into account interdisciplinary, uh, gender dimension, and also open science practices. Um, you should show how your project could contribute to the outcomes and impact 
impact describes in the work program. This is what we call the pathway to impact. And you should describe in a clear way the plant measures to maximize the impact of your project. This is what we call the plan for the dissemination and exploitation, including communication activities. Uh, and then, of course, you should demonstrate the quality of your work plan, including resources. So um, this is, uh, again, a kind of checklist of all the policy and horizontal considerations that you always have to take into account in your proposals, including in these mission calls. So uh, for all program, for all parts of the program, it's important that you take seriously the open science practices. You also need to take into consideration the gender dimension in research and innovation content unless otherwise specified in the topic conditions, the pathway to impact, the measures to maximize impact, and also we are giving uh, plenty of act attention to artificial intelligence. These are aspects that we always uh, assess that you also need to take into consideration, but there it could be that there are other aspects that you need to take into account and do those will be mentioned in the topic conditions. So I will go um, in all these aspects that I have listed to give you more information. So open science across the program. So this is important and is relevant for all calls in Horizon Europe, including the mission calls. So open science is an approach based on open cooperative work and systemat systematic sharing of knowledge and tools as early as and widely as possible in the process. And this includes active engagement of society. And this is very important at the time of the preparation of your proposal. So as you probably know, there is um, a, it is mandatory to offer open access to all publications but you need uh, to take into consideration that uh, you need to retain sufficient IPRs to comply with open access requirements in case you decide to publish in um, journals that are not in open access. And then we also have a, a mandatory request to provide a, a data management plan for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable research uh, data. Um, these are important information that you need to take into account. Um, and as I said, uh, the, uh, the main change in Horizon Europe is that the open science practice, practices should be taken into account very seriously, seriously when you design your scientific methodology. If gender dimension in research and innovation content is also a very important uh, horizontal topic that needs to be uh, taken into consideration in all Horizon Europe calls, unless otherwise specified in the call or topic conditions. This is a change from Horizon 2020, because in Horizon 2020, we were flagging those topics in which gender dimension was important and it had to be taken into account. So the approach in Horizon Europe is that uh, we consider that gender dimension is important in all Horizon Europe calls, and we only mentioned in the topic condition when this is not the case. Yeah. So um, we are not talking about uh, gender balance here. So we are talking about uh, uh, to take very seriously the gender dimension in the content of your research. And here I have listed a number of examples that will help you to understand what we mean with gender dimension in research and innovation content. So for instance, uh, for research um, uh, dealing with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it will be important to observe uh, or to explain or to try to, to make research on why there are differences between women and men in infection levels and mortality rates. Um, another example, uh, for instance, is um, in research dealing with uh, car safety. Does it make sense to design car safety equipment only on the basis of male body standards? 
And here you also have a number of examples, for instance, the last one related to climate change. And did you know that climate change change is affecting sex determination in a number of marine species. So this is what we mean with gender dimension and res uh, in research and innovation content. So unless um, uh, it is uh, specifically mentioned in the topic condition that this uh, should not be taken into consideration, you need to take into consideration gender dimension in your proposal. And if you think that it will not be relevant for your proposal, you need to explain why in your proposal. So then um, I would also like to mention here some details about the new approach to impact in, in the proposal. As I said, um, it's not new what we are asking. So in Horizon 2020, we were also asking you to explain what will be the impact of your proposal taking into account that the basis line is the expected outcome and impact that we publish in the work program and topic. And this does not change. So this approach is exactly the same in Horizon Europe. What we have changed and, we, and, and always trying to help you to, to explain what will be the impact of your proposal is uh, to use the methodology called the key impact pathways or the pathway to impact and uh, trying to explain in the proposal template how we, you will have to explain the impact in order to help uh, the evaluators and also us in the, in the European Union services to understand what will be the impact of your proposal. Uh, so in, in, in the end, it's not new what we call the pathway to impact. It's just a new way to describe what we uh, expect from you at the time you describe your impact and always trying to help you to simplify um, or to provide uh, tools that will help you to uh, explain the impact of your proposal. So um, with this methodology, what we are trying to, to highlight is that the starting point for you, not for us, because uh, what we uh, defined in the topic condition as expected outcome and expected impact is uh, produced after a long process of discussion with uh, stakeholders. So uh, the starting point for you will be what we published as uh, expected outcome and expected impact in the topic conditions. So this will be your starting point at the time you write your proposal. And this for instance, we have an example here of expected outcome and an impact in the work program. Here, um, you will have to, to, to read what we expect from the projects that we found in the project, and then you will have to present in your proposal what will be the results, the project results that you expect to have in your proposal and what will be the contribution of these project results to the expected outcome, medium term, and the expected impact, longer term, uh, as described in the topic conditions. And the means that we have to maximize this impact are explained in the dissemination and exploitation plan. This is, as I said, is exactly uh, what we ask in Horizon 2020, but we have tried to present um, to present it in a way that is uh, clearly for you to, to explain to us. Uh, here is also, I will not go into the details here, but here is uh, the way, um, so it's, it's a kind of listing the steps that we have in order to write what we publish in the, um, in the work program. So the expected impact in the destinations and the expected outcomes in the topic conditions. And we, of course, start our discussions with the general EU policy priorities, like the Green Deal, Fit for Digital Aids, etc. We define together with the member states and stakeholders what will be the key strategic orientations and the impact areas. And finally, for every destination and topic, define the expected impacts and uh, topics. This is our work, internal work, 
your work is in the right hand side will be to start from what you uh, expect to produce in your project and how these results will contribute to the expected uh, outcomes, uh, medium term, and expected impacts uh, longer term um, as described in the topic conditions. Um, as I explained, the measures to maximize the impact is what we call the dissemination and exploitation plan, including communication activities. And here is also not new. We were also asking this plan in Horizon Europe, but here we have tried to include uh, more information about what we expect in this dissemination and exploitation uh, plan, including communication activities. For instance, as a novelty, we include in the proposal template that uh, besides to explain the measures, the measures that you want to include in your proposal, you also have to give us what the identity of the target groups, those that will benefit uh, from the results of the project, what will be your communication uh, activities, um, whether your results will be will have an effect in 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 the design of uh, policy, and also uh, of course if you want to exploit your results, we were asking in the proposal template already uh, to identify whether you have this intention to to exploit uh, the results. And finally, um, and this is also a novelty in Horizon Europe, we are assessing all across the program whether the proposal includes artificial intelligence. So this is not only uh, about research on artificial intelligence, but it is also about the use of artificial intelligence in other areas of research. So, um, so we are asking uh, the experts uh, in all evaluations in Horizon Europe, whether the proposal include artificial intelligence uh, as a part of, as, as a tool for the research uh, proposed or as a research on artificial intelligence. And we, were, uh, we are asking the, the technical experts uh, about the robustness of these uh, proposed artificial intelligence-based systems. So the technical experts will make some comments that will be taken into account later on in the ethics review of the proposal. So, and, and this is done, as I said, in, in, in all uh, calls in Horizon Europe. So I finished the, my presentation here. I only add here a list of um, links where you can find other information to complement uh, what I have presented today. So thank you very much. If you have questions now, I will be happy to answer. Working companies. Uh, Franz, I was did, not listening. So, sorry. It's did, the first question. Uh, did you hear me? The first question, yes, is about the researchers. Uh, whether also those that work in companies should be included in this table. Of course, yes. So we, in the proposal template that we published in the in the participation portal, we include the definition of researcher is uh, does not cover only academic research so of course if in a company um, there are people doing research they they should be listed in this table yes okay and then a related question uh, on the gender balance so if not all res or all people involved in the project need to be listed there where can we provide information about the gender balance in the consortium um we we are not uh, asking about the identity of all people involved in the projects, uh, mainly because we know that at the time the proposal is prepared, probably many uh, organizations do not know yet or still need to contract some people if they will do the contract only if they are funded, if they get the funds. 
Um, this is not new. In the past, we were also doing the same, and we continue this. So if the question is about uh, the criteria to rank proposals with the same scores, that one of the criteria is to look into gender balance. So as mentioned in the work program annex, um, for this, we are looking only into the gender of the researchers listed in the researchers table. Okay, thanks. Then the next question, taking into account the transdisciplinary view of missions, will evaluators for mission topics be selected in a different manner when compared to cluster topics? Well, this is probably a question for the operational services. So um, all the evaluators are selected, taking into account the topic that they need to evaluate. So I assume that, of course, the mission um, characteristics will be taken into account when selecting the, the experts that will evaluate the goals. Yeah. I think it will be very similar because also in other topics in the clusters, we look for transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity. Uh, so indeed, yeah. There will not be a big difference. Next question, taking into account the transdisciplinarity view. No, that's the same question. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I got confused. When will the online questionnaire be adopted to distinguish between mandatory aspects and recommended areas? So when will... Yes, I, I know what this question is about because mm -hmm. <clears throat> indeed in the proposal template we include some of the of the criteria to for the gender equality plan of the organization. So that this, some of them are mandatory, some mm. others are recommendations. And that was not correctly translated in the participant database and is not flagged which of these criteria are mandatory or uh, recommended or recommended. This will be solved in the coming weeks. Yeah, so it's still not in production. It's still not correct. So it will be solved someday, but you cannot exactly say when. No, I cannot say. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, then the next question is, how do evaluators face the proposal to first address part B and then check part A? And when are they supposed to check information in part A? I can answer to this question. Yes, please, we, France, you have more since experience. Since we run the evaluation, they will look always in both. They do individual assessment of the full proposal, so they look in part B and part A while doing their individual assessment. Um, so they look into both. Yes, so we, we, we send to the experts both documents at the same time, so it's up to them to, 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 to see when they check part A or part B. Okay, then there's a question on a past evaluation um, that happened already in December. Does my participant have a GEP, need to have a GEP to sign the grant agreement? No, this, this uh, criteria starts to be applicable only um, for calls with deadlines in 2022. So for calls uh, with deadline in the past year, in 2021, uh, the question was still included in the proposal template, but the eligibility criterion was not applicable. So for the last year's call or all 21 calls, it's not yet uh, taken into full effect, but uh, from the 22 calls, which are the mission, no, the, the mission calls are still 21 calls that we talk about in this info day. Uh, no, but the deadline is in 2022. Ah, it's when the deadline is. So it will need to be, all participants will need to have a GEP or research organizations, and, right? For this yes. course that we talk about. Okay. How long grant agreement preparation can wait that association takes effect? Thinking for UK. Well, um Difficult this one. is a question difficult to answer at this moment. Uh, at, at this moment, um, we know that from last year we have many projects waiting in the GAP agreement preparation stage, so waiting for for the association agreement of uh, United Kingdom to take effect. Um, but this is not happening. So as as you all know, it's out of our control and. Um, very soon we will have to take a decision of what to do with those cases and um, yeah for the time being the instructions is that we still wait a bit longer 
and then at the time we take a decision we cannot wait any longer so um, the solution will be to of course to treat the united kingdom participants as a third country participants and um, they can only uh, participate as beneficiaries receiving funding exceptionally so we have to justify uh, the exceptional funding of uh, these participants and 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 this makes take time take uh, time yeah, but we will decide. not delay the grant agreements signature so the eight months uh, between call deadline and signature of the grant will stay in place we try but there are still there are already cases that the deadline is over now so we are still waiting so oh. in the end it's a decision of the responsible authorizing officer that will decide whether we can not wait or whether we wait with an exception or um, yeah so this is a case by case yeah. okay thank you um, there's one more question. I, I take the latest one because I think the top five we have already answered, or the top two. It's about similar case for about the Swiss partners. Uh, if they stay within the indicative budget of the, I cannot fully read it. Octavia, can you move away the first two questions? Or, yeah. thanks. Now I can still not read it. Okay, we take. The Swiss partners, if they stay within the indicative budget of the proposal in case Swiss is reclassified as a country to be associated before the deadline of the calls. It's also difficult to answer, yeah. but uh, the current uh, situation is that uh, Switzerland is not considered as a to be associated country and, and we have to go ahead with this assumption. Yeah. This is the current situation. Yeah. And then the in so the Swiss partners, if they put zero budget requests from the EU, then they they don't they this their own budget can go beyond the the indicative budget, right? Yes. So Swiss partners will not be beneficiaries of the grant, so they will participate as associated partners. They don't sign the, the grant agreement. They don't receive funding, but they are still participants to to this project. Um, yeah, and, and of course, in the proposal, they need to tell us uh, the cost that they will incur, and I assume it will be um, the budget coming from, from Switzerland government, uh, Swiss government. Okay. I'm um, talking about associated partners. Do the researchers of those also need to be included in the table in Part A? Yes, they also need to be included in table of Part A, yeah. Okay. And taking into account now this question we already had. It looks like we consumed all our questions. Um, there's one more. Are expected impacts for different uh, are there expected impacts for the different missions? Or does the overall goal count as expected impact? How does this affect the impact section? and the key IPs. Uh, if I am not mistaken, and this, uh, France, maybe you know more than me, um, so the expected outcomes will be uh, uh, included in the topic conditions. And then the expected impacts will be uh, linked to every specific mission, if I am not mistaken. So the mission calls um, are at the same level as the destination in other Pillar 2 calls. So you will have to read both uh, parts of the work program, although in the portal you will uh, in, uh, have published in the topic conditions also what will be the expected impacts. But um, again, uh, expected outcomes are in the topic conditions, expected impacts will be at the level of the mission. Yes, and my understanding would also be so that the missions have very clear uh, overall goals um, and, of course, each proposal should explain how it can contribute to these overall goals of the mission, which is, for example, for the ocean mission, is a pollution-free ocean or blue, uh, uh, um, uh, carbon-free blue economy. Yeah, so these are the overall very clear goals of each mission, and, of course, each proposal should somehow explain how they can contribute to achieving this one, or, one or several of these specific 
objectives. Right? Uh, do we have more questions? Yes. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, a bit. Um, so what is a reasonable scale in years for medium-term outcomes and long-term impacts? I think this is this is def difficult to answer for me because it depends on the part of the program. So you will really uh, find this information at the time you create the topic conditions and the destination or the mission uh, expected impacts. Yeah. Okay. And indeed, it depends really in, in the details, but the missions should be achieved in, on a not too long term. So we, ex we hope the missions really deliver results, tangible results in short to medium term. Um, so on staying in the same topic, project impact pathways, can you in future sessions give another example than the one with airports? <laughs> It would be useful to see an example in a social field, indeed. So that's kind of a comment. Yes, uh, but if I am not mistaken, in info days of goals uh, related of uh, or more uh, uh, at the side of the social, they also include other examples. Yeah. So there but are it, more this examples. is more for the operational services dealing with the with the topic uh, itself. Yeah, but we yeah. will try. Back to the issue with the associated countries. What happens if the whole proposal is, to the whole proposal if a partner country is eventually not admitted as associated country? Well, this again is uh, it has to be analyzed uh, case by case. So um, you uh, the proposals will be informed of what we plan to do. It could be that we offered the consortium to replace this participant. It could be that we uh, ask our experts whether they agree to exceptionally fund um, the participants coming from, from the third country. Or it could also be that um, we ask the coordinator to redistribute the task to also redistribute the budget with the possibility that uh, if the project is running um, in the first months of the project, the, the partner the, coming from the to be associated country can be reintroduced in the consortium. These are possibilities. So um, what to do in every uh, situation is to be analyzed uh, case by case and is a decision that the responsible outsourcing officer of that call needs uh, to take. Um, two more questions. Maybe we are a bit late, but very quickly, does each consortium partner need to have a separate GEP? I think that's very obvious. The answer is yes. Yes. And is there a platform available to search for possible partners in a project? Also, yes. In, in the portal, you have the, the participant search. And I think Olivier, if I am not mistaken, will present this in the in the next uh, presentation. Yeah. Indeed, thanks. And that already um, moves over to Olivier, so to our next presentation, which we should really start now. And that's by given by Olivier Margan, and he will introduce the funding and tenders portal. Please, Olivier. Thank you very much, Franz, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for sticking with us throughout the day. So I know that it's been uh, quite dense in terms of information that you have received. Uh, unfortunately, my presentation will not be will not make it any less dense. But hopefully, I will be able to give you some clues, some tips on how to use the funding and tenders portal, which I guess some of you are already comfortable with. But uh, I will give some tips uh, for total beginners and also a few tips for people who know more. Uh, how to use the system, but hopefully it will be uh, a bit helpful for everyone. Let's start with the page that you must already know. Uh, this is the homepage of the Funding and Tenders portal. You see that there's a public access menu on the top part of the screen. And if you click on the login button on the top right, it will display a new menu on the side, which is the personalized access to the IT tools, the so-called My Area. And you also have access to the uh, information about your account, again, on the top right corner of the screen. The basic philosophy of the portal, the way it's built, it's based on three different things. 
So we first have the EU login account, which you all know. This is the personalized account for each individual user of the portal. So this is the unique identifier for persons. Next to that, we have the so-called PIC numbers, the participant identification code, which are the identifiers for the organizations. And on top of this, we have a third layer, which is the uh, identity and access management system. This is the whole system of roles, which you can see at the bottom of the slide, they are uh, represented by those little colorful characters. And actually, this is what will grant you uh, access to the tools themselves. We will detail all those three steps, starting very quickly with the EU login account. So if you need to create a new EU login account, it's very easy, it's very fast. You just need to click on the register button. It will take you to a screen where you need to enter your personal information, so your name and your email address. Uh, please use your professional email address and not any functional mailbox. The reason behind this is that as it's linked to a user account, if someone has access to sign some legal documents, for example, everyone having access to this functional mailbox can then have access to those same documents as well. So please use your professional email address. And once you have filled in this information, you will receive an email. You just click on the link that you have received in this email, set up your password, and that's it. So this is what the screen looks like, very uh, standard for all the, the websites where you need to create an account. And again, we cannot uh, underline enough the fact that you should not share your EU login credentials with anyone. This takes us to the next stage, getting a PIC number, so registering your organization in the system. Uh, for this, you need to have an EU login account first, because otherwise you will not be able to register your organization in the system. And it's really a mandatory step getting this particip participant identification code, because if you don't have a PIC number, you cannot uh, be part of a proposal in the proposal submission system. So it's very important that you make sure that your organization is already registered. And uh, before you uh, start registering your organization, please make sure that your organization is not already registered into the system. So to do so, you click on the how to participate menu on the top, and you will arrive on this page where you basically have two options. You can either look for a pick, a pick search, so that you can see whether the organization is already registered, or if you are looking for a specific PIC number, so the PIC number of another organization to include in your own proposal, this is also the place where you can get this information. Uh, if you need to register the organization, it's of course the blue button on the right. This will take you to this screen, so after you have logged in, uh, you see this metro line on the top, which is really uh, uh, all the steps that need to be completed in order to receive your PIC number at the end. So you can save your registration at any time uh, in case you need to find additional information which you don't have uh, available at the time of registering and resume it anytime you want. Uh, just know that when you enter some information, you can see that here when I started registering my organization, I have put the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique and France as a registration country. And if I click on Next, you can see that the system is also doing a search in the background to look for duplicate information. So if, if the system finds some organizations that fit the criteria that I have put in, they will be uh, shown on this screen, and I can use this pick number instead of registering another organization, which would require additional work uh, behind the scenes in order to merge accounts into a single one. Uh, the person who registers his organization or her organization receives the self-registrant role. So this is really the person who registers the organization, and that person will become the main contact with the commission until the leer is appointed. Uh, very important, you do not need to appoint a leer or to have your organization validated if you are not part of a successful proposal. So when you submit a proposal, it's okay if your PIC number is only declared, if it's only provisional, because it will be validated only if your proposal is successful. So you do not need to worry that uh, your organization is completely validated into the system. 
Very important as well if you need to contact the validation services, which is the services which is in charge of validating the organization, there is a place to do so into the participant register itself. I will show it in a few screens uh, so that you know where to click. This takes me to the most complex part of my presentation, unfortunately. So this is really the whole system of roles, the identity and access management. What is it? So this is really the whole system that allows you to have access to the IT tools. It makes sure that your access is personalized and secure. So you have both aspects covered uh, within the system. Uh, it may also look a bit uh, cumbersome in some cases, but you must know that this system is flexible enough to accommodate all cases. So whether it's a consortium with dozens of large companies or a mono-person, uh, mono-beneficiary grant, it works in all cases. So the flexibility is there. And any change in the system, when you grant a new role or when you revoke an existing role, all those changes will be monitored and tracked so that you can, at any point in time, know who was in charge, who had which role, who had access to what. This is what the identity and access management look like. So you, you see that there are lots of different characters, a lot of different colors, lots of acronyms as well, because it's hard to gather all the information uh, in, in such a tiny screen. Uh, don't worry, I'll try to translate for you uh, using the, the real terms and not the, the acronyms. Um, what you must understand is that it's divided in several parts. So let's take first the horizontal layers you have on top the coordinating beneficiary. This is really the organization which is coordinating the whole proposal. And if need be, there can be as many participating beneficiaries as needed, so the bottom layers. So this is one example with one company. If you have several organizations, you will just have many uh, identical uh, layers as the second one. And then you have some vertical divisions as well. So let's take them starting from the left. We have first the organization roles. So those are the people who will be in charge of keeping the data of your organization up to date. They will not have a direct access into the project. So they will not directly intervene when it comes, for example, to, to reporting. This is the role of the project roles, the part in the middle, the vertical part in the middle. Those are all the people that will be able to access your projects, be it during the grant preparation phase, during reporting, amendments, uh, and so on. And then on the right hand side you have the audit roles, uh, which I will leave out of this presentation, but just know that in case uh, you are facing an audit, this will also be done in the system directly and there are roles for this. So I recommend you to check the documentation in case you are in this case. So this is just a slide uh, for you so that you understand all the, the acronyms that we are using and the full names as well. So I will not read everything, but just so you know, the presentation will be available on the website uh, normally in a few days. And so in case you need any uh, reference information, there it is. There are some very important remarks to keep in mind in case you need to uh, use the role system. So the first one is that the LEAR, the legal entity appointed representative, and the primary coordinator contacts, you see in the, the, the graph, those were the little characters with the caps. Those two roles are the only ones which are defined and modified by the commission. For all the other roles, it's really managed directly by the consortium. So all the people within the consortium will have access to the tool and will be able to grant and revoke all the other roles. Also, those two roles with the caps are the, the only roles which are really unique into the system. So if you need to have other roles, there can be technically, technically as many or as few as needed. It's up to you entirely. But there can only be one layer and one primary coordinator contact. But one person can have several roles at the same time. What does it mean? It means that all those different characters can be represented by one single person, one single EU login uh, account. So this is very important to keep in mind because, as I was saying, in the case of a mono-beneficiary grant, for example, uh, it will mean that one single person, for example, the uh, CEO of the company, can accumulate all those roles and do everything into the system. Uh, we have seen that it can be quite complex, but at the same time, the minimal configuration for a grant to work is to have one lead at the level of the organization, 
and for each project to have a primary coordinator contact and a legal signatories and financial signatories assigned to the project. Again, I will uh, dig a little bit deeper in a minute. Who can do what? So all those roles, uh, the way they work is that when you start at the bottom, you have the very basic rights, like for example, the team member at the bottom on the project roles uh, has a read-only access to, the, to all the tools. But if you go one level above, you have the task manager, which has the read access, but also the write access to the forms. So he can enter the information, but not submit this information to the coordinator. Uh, this is the role of the participant contact. Also one level above, we have the financial signatories and legal signatories who have access to sign the financial forms or legal forms, depending on which role, and uh, submit those to the coordinator contact, which is the top role at the level of the project. So we have the primary coordinator contact, only one, who can be assisted by as many coordinator contacts as needed. And they have the read, write, and submit access of the forms of the whole consortium to the commission. It works the same way for the organization roles. We start at the bottom, so we have the legal signatories uh, who have uh, read-only access to the uh, data of the organization. But if we go one level above, we have the LEAR, so the unique role of the LEAR, which can be helped by as many or as few account administrators as possible. So account administrators can do exactly the same uh, tasks as the LEAR and they can uh, have access to the organization data. They can view them, but also modify them and have access to the basic lists of projects, proposals, and roles. So uh, how does it start? Because it doesn't come up just out of the blue. It starts already at the level of the proposal. So the person who initiated the proposal for the main coordinator will receive the primary coordinator contact role uh, during the grant preparation phase. Every person that has been appointed as main contact for all the participating organizations will become participant contacts after the proposal has been uh, submitted and successful. When we talk about the LEAR, the LEAR is a role which is validated by the commission during a separate process and uh, there needs to be one LEAR per organization. I have included a, a link to the LEAR appointment procedure, which is uh, an issue that is uh, recurring. So uh, this is, we, have, we receive a lot of questions about the LEAR appointment, and you can have more information there. Uh, so we have said that the power is in your hands when it comes to granting and revoking access. And this is the illustration. So who can do what? The primary coordinator contact can basically grant or revoke all the roles at the level of the project in his own organization. And he can also uh, nominate or revoke the participant contacts in the other organizations. Why? Because if there is some, uh, some documents are missing when you are reaching a deadline and the primary coordinator contact doesn't receive any info from one beneficiary, the whole process gets stuck. So the primary coordinator contact has the power to nominate a new person so that they are sure that they meet the deadline uh, when it comes to reporting, for example. Uh, the coordinator contacts can do exactly the same. The only difference is that they cannot directly revoke or nominate a new primary co coordinator contact. Otherwise, at the level of the project, they can nominate and revoke everyone in their own organizations and the participant contacts for, the, for every beneficiaries. The participant contacts can nominate and revoke everyone at the level of the project in their own organizations, and that's it. So it does not go beyond their own organization. And if we go at the level of the organization roles, basically the LEAR and the account administrators can nominate all the legal signatories and financial signatories, but the LEAR is the only one who can uh, nominate and revoke the access of account administrators will do uh, exactly the same uh, tasks as he does or she does, of course. How to proceed? So if you need to grant a role to someone, the important information is the email address because this will be the email address that is linked to the EU login account. But what happens if the user does not have an EU login account? Then simply it will be created for that person. So just use the email address into the system and a new EU login account will be automatically created. 
Uh, if you want to grant project roles, this is really simple. So you just log in into the system. You see on the left hand side, we have my area and my projects. So project roles and my project, it's fairly logical. Uh, you can see a list of all your projects there. And for each line on the right, you have an actions button. Uh, if you can do this, you have this manage consortium button. If you click on it, you will reach this screen, which is basically an overview of your whole consortium. And if you have the right to do so, you have the edit roles. Uh, if you click on it, you will see all the roles in your organization at the level of the project, and you will be able to add a new role or to delete an existing one. It's the same principle for the roles at the level of the organizations. You log in, you go in my organizations instead, which is again, fairly logical. And for all the organizations which you are a part of, so you can see that there are a lot of organizations there, but this is more uh, my, uh, my account, which has a lot of data. Uh, for each organization, you have those actions button and you click on view roles. It will take you to this screen where you have a few buttons where you can do searches and look for existing roles. And if you click on the button on the right, edit organization roles, it's the same principle. You see all the roles for the organization. You can grant new roles and revoke existing roles. Uh, the case of the LEAR is a little bit different. As I said, it needs to be validated by the validation services. So for your own organization, you can go on modify organizations. And this will take you to this screen where you have a tab authorized users slash LEAR, where you can either request for a new LEAR to be appointed or provide all the documents to a nominate a LEAR if it's the first time that your organization is validated. There is one special case, again, the legal signatories and the financial signatories. So it happens in two steps. First, you need to have the LEAR or the account administrators that provide the list of people that we have the legal power to sign the documents, so the legal signatories and the financial signatories. But once they are nominated by the LEAR, they will not have access to the system yet. They need to be uh, assigned to a project by the primary coordinator contact, coordinator contacts, or participant contacts. You see that they shift from being L signs or F signs to PL signs and PF signs. And this little P makes all the difference because this means that they are assigned to a project and they will have access to the tools there. We are slowly reaching the end of my presentation. I will just go very quickly over some of those slides, which are maybe a little bit less uh, interesting for you. Uh, my project is the tab that you will use to manage all the steps of your projects, uh, also to, uh, uh, the, to manage the grant preparation, for example, the amendments or the reporting. Uh, I will not go over the paperless submission, but just know that when an L sign or an F sign clicks on the sign and submit button, it will trigger an e receipt, which is very much as the documents that you receive uh, for the administration. This is the PDF that you submitted, which has a digital seal over it, and you can just distribute this e receipt uh, to anyone. You can store it wherever you want, but if you try to edit it, then the seal will be breached and the, legal doc the document will lose its legal value. So this is important to know that the e-receipt can be transferred and uh, stored, but they cannot be modified in any way. Uh, my organizations, I will not uh, touch this, is just so that you know, we were talking about the partner search. It was one of the questions. If you go in how to participate, you can see that there's a partner search in there where you can search for organizations uh, here you can do a search. If you click on one organization, you see the public profile of the organization, which can be managed by the LEAR or the account administrators. Further down on this page, you have a list of projects uh, that the organization took part in, and you can contact this organization if you want to have them part of your proposal. Uh, this is uh, just a reminder that in case you receive some uh, undesired uh, messages like spam or phishing, there are some steps that can be done. I have included at the bottom the link to the FAQ, so the, you don't need to read all this because it's written very small. But again, you will find all the information uh, in the presentation itself. Also, quick note, you have notifications and formal notifications. The only difference is that uh, formal notifications are used when we need an acknowledgement of receipt. So for example, when a beneficiary is terminated, a grant is terminated, we need to make sure that you have opened this notification. 
all the other notifications arrive in the uh, My Notifications, which is right there on the top right part of the screen. And in case you receive an email, you will have a copy of this email in the notifications. So again, in case you are not sure that the email that you receive is not genuine, is not uh, sent by the commission, if you don't find a copy in your notifications, then indeed it's probably a spam or phishing attempt. I don't want to scare you away because those cases are uh, still very rare, but you must be aware that it might uh, happen. Uh, this is just to show you uh, what the notifications look like. Finally, just my last tip. Uh, my account is a part which is not very well known, but uh, this is very useful because this is the place, for example, where you can see all the roles that you have. So I will show you uh, where it's hidden. You can see there you have the, the little icon with your face and you have all those different options. And if you click on my roles, here you can see all the roles that you have at the level of the organization, the project, and further down, you will also have the proposal role so that you can always be sure that you have the right access at the right time. Uh, this is also the place where you can manage your account if you want to activate the two-step verification, like on most websites these days. And finally, my uh, very last slide is if you need any support in any case, then there's the, the support tab in the Funding and Tenders portal, and you will be able to access the online manual, which is the guide for the business processes, and we have its IT counterpart, the IT How To, uh, where you can find almost all the information. And in case it's not enough, you can still go and uh, ask the help desk and the support services. Uh, just make sure that you select the right program because not all the services are available for all the programs in the Funding and Tenders portal. And with this, uh, this is the end of my presentation and I will be able to take the questions from now on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier, for this very interesting and I hope helpful inf information, uh, presentation. I think you provided a lot of useful information and actually also, uh, yes, please join me here, and a lot of useful links in your presentation and the first question actually is about that. So is it possible to have access to your presentation, to the slides, so people can click on the links? Yes, so I know that it will be available in a few days. It might not be available directly uh, after the end of the event or tomorrow, but in maximum five days it should be available on the event website. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is it possible to restore the function of changing the order of participants already inserted if needs be, as it was on the Horizon 2020? I must admit I don't know whether it's a functionality that uh, is uh, in the works, but uh, we can certainly uh, note down the suggestion and uh, yeah, we'll take it into, into account. Great. Thanks. Um, next question. When more than one account is locked in for the same proposal, data being encoded at the same time can be randomly cancelled. The EU help desk has confirmed this malfunction. Will this be fixed? Otherwise, the coordinator needs to encode the data for part A for everybody. Do you understand the question? Yes, I understand. Um, unfortunately, the answer is a bit out of my hands, obviously. Uh, I'm sure that if it's a known issue, uh, there are certainly some attempts which are being made to fix this. Um, for the time being, if you are not sure, the best is just to try and uh, manage a little bit to contact uh, the other participants and just make sure that you are not all working at the same time. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have any, any easy answer for this one. Okay, we have more questions. During proposal application, is it possible to revoke editing rights from all partners so only proposal coordinators can edit the application? Um, I think this will be more a question for my colleague uh, Dave, who's uh, the, the next presentation. He will really uh, mention the whole submission system. Um, I think that you, if you remove the rights, you remove all the rights. I don't think that you can just edit the rights and block the, the proposal, but he will confirm this. Okay, thank you. Then, which question we didn't have? Have associated partners also access to pages of the project on the FNT portal of the project? Will all information be available like for the beneficiaries? Uh, the information that you will see is really based on the roles that you have in the system. So if they have a role in the system, they will be able to access the information, otherwise not. Okay, so it depends on which roles you give to whom. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's quite 
clear. Then we have another question on Switzerland. Yeah, I saw it before it disappeared. Yeah. So it's basically whether they can create an EU login account. Uh, yes, so there's no geographical restriction or no restriction whatsoever. So we know that some people, for example, have several EU login accounts. It's a technical possibility. There is no technical uh, restriction whatsoever when it comes to creating uh, EU login accounts. Good, and we have time for one more question or two more. What if an organization has appointed a Lear long ago and they do not know who is it? Sending messages from the system to Lear are left unattended. What do you do? Yes, so the first thing would be to use the contact form into the system. So you just look for the organization and try to contact the organization. Uh, because this message will arrive to the Lear and all the people that might have also the account administrator role. If this still doesn't work, then you have seen that in the system you may have access in the My Organizations tab. So you log in, My Area, My Organizations. And then if you have access to the, to the tool, you will be able to request the change of LIA. It will not be automatic. It's not like granting or revoking a role. But at least the validation services know that you want to change the LIA. And there will be a whole process uh, that will be put in place. And you will be contacted by the, by the validation services in order to uh, nominate a new LIA. OK. So let me see. We have, I think there's a few more questions. And we have time. Mm -hmm. I think this one we had already. Yes. I don't know. Um, is there a kind of test system for the FNT portal for testing processes like signature? Otherwise, is it only possible to learn such processes if they are acute? So th there is no sandbox mode, let's say, for the funding and tenders portal. Uh, now, the thing is that it's all based on processes. So the thing is that if you have the right access right, and the time is right in the whole process, then you will have access to this sign and submit button. Uh, in this case, then if you press on the button, it will trigger the creation of the e-receipt, as I mentioned during the presentation. And there's not much more than I can say. If you want to have more information about the IT systems, I suggest that you visit the IT How To Wiki, because you have some videos, some screenshots that explain the whole thing in detail. And I think that's, uh, for the moment, your best bet if you want to have more information about how it goes in the IT tool itself. Okay, is the two-factor authentication possible or advisable? Uh, yes, so it's possible and it's advisable. So it's a, it's a practice which is not strictly limited to the funding and tenders portal. This is something that is more and more implemented. You already have it on big websites like Google, for example, where you can uh, register your mobile device in order to increase the security of your account. So it's uh, certainly advisable that you do this. And uh, when it comes to the technical details, um, I don't have all the details myself, but it works exactly the same way uh, as any big website would have. So as I have seen, uh, as I have shown you in the presentation, just click on my account. And then in my account, you will be able to register your mobile device. And it will ask you when you use your eagle login account to confirm via a QR code or via an SMS. There's also an app, right? And there's also an app, yes, indeed. Great. Uh, one more. Many organizations register to all open topics on the Fund and Tenders Opportunity Portal, Cons for example, consulting companies. How to find really interested partners? Well, for each topic, actually, when you are uh, looking into one specific topic, you will have the partner search uh, offers. So actually, this is really a section in the topic page itself where you will see the organizations that post a partner search, the expertise offers or expertise requests. So either organizations which are proposing their expertise, but which do not know with whom to go and with whom to form a consortium. Or you can have some uh, organizations which are part of existing proposals, existing, existing consortia, and who are looking for uh, an additional partners. And this is all posted on the page, on the topic page itself. Uh, I have not shown this in my presentation, but if you need to edit those uh, partner search requests, this is the LEAR or the account administrators who can do so in my organizations. Thank you very much, Olivier. We answered all the questions and we start our last talk of today almost in time. And that talk will be given by Dave Bird, who also works in the CIC. Dave, are you here? Yes. Please, you have 25 minutes. Can you hear me OK? Yes. I've got a bit of echo on my mic, but uh, OK. Be here and see you well. Okay. 
Okay, okay that's, that's better. better. Now, now the echo is gone. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I imagine you're all a little bit fatigued, so apologies, but I, I think I'm the last on the agenda. Now, after Olivier's explanation of how the funding and tenders portal works and how you search for your um, topics and so on, I'm going to show you how to create and submit a proposal. Okay, and I'm going to go through some of the potential pitfalls and things you need to look out for along the way. So here you see I'm in the funding and tenders portal and I'm on the home screen. And I'm actually logged in as myself. And then down the left hand side, you see I have my area. So all this has been explained by Olivier. I won't go into it now, but we will be coming back to it in a moment. First of all, you need to find the topic that you want to apply for. You can do that in various ways. So you can scroll through and go down to the landing pages of the various programs. So here we click on Horizon Europe. But of course, if we were to view all of the existing topics, there's 906, which would be an awful lot to scroll through. So we would actually type some keywords and we're going to be looking for a topic. So the EU mission, of course, and one on cancer. And that comes up with three hits. OK, so we have three topics and the one I'm looking for is this one. Cancer 0203. So you see, then you have a hyperlink. That you click and it takes you to the topic page. And then you have all the information you need on the topic, a description of it, the type of action, the type of model grant agreement that will be used, some high level information, the topic conditions and documents, very important. Then the partner search. We can have a look at that that Olivier was just referring to. OK, so you can look through here to see if there are people who are interested to work with you. You can also put um, your own content in here to request uh, people to work with you. So the other way, so to pull people towards you rather than than looking. OK, but that's not the focus of this particular part. And then if you scroll down, 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 you'll see you have a start submission. So once you're sure you've got the correct topic, and that's very important because you don't want to apply for the wrong topic um, and then get all the way through to the end of submission and then realize you've made a mistake. Um, it can sometimes be possible to have the proposal transferred between topics, but it's not always the case. So please be very, very sure you apply for the correct topic. OK, so it will you will have to select it. OK, it's a horizon research and innovation action and RIA. And you click on start submission and again, it will say, are you sure you're applying for the correct thing? So this is, this is the first hurdle to get across. Okay. And as a reference, for instance, three different cancer topics here, they may be very, very similar. I'm not the business expert. Uh, the differences between them might be minimal. So, so pay attention. So when you confirm, it takes you into the create proposal screen. Now, all the screens on the submission tool have pretty much the same layout. So you have the title of the screen, you have the deadline of the call, you have some high level uh, call topic information here. You have a section for downloading the part B templates. And then you have a support um, panel down here at the bottom. So you have access to an online manual, a how to IT help desk email and an FAQ. And the FAQ is um, it's a body of knowledge that's built up over the years. Um, it's not just for the Horizon uh, program, it's for all programs, but it can be filtered for your specific program or your specific topic, okay? And as the, um, as the call progresses, and as applicants ask calls of the call coordination team, those that are deemed of common knowledge to everyone will normally be posted in the FAQ so that everybody can read them and everybody can get equal treatment. Down at the bottom, we have the service desk. So we have an email address and we have a telephone number. And this service desk is manned from eight in the morning until eight in the evening on um, business working days in Brussels. Okay, so it's a, it's a central European time. These people are extremely experienced with helping applicants get through technical difficulties. Not so much business issues. If they get a business issue, they'll get help from the core coordination team but they know how to solve the most common problems uh, on the IT side, okay? So the moment 
if you do hit an issue, we hope you don't, and the system is is over the years become quite robust, but with the new the framework program, there have been a, a few small teething problems, it's true, but these are now being ironed out. If you do hit in any issues, it's a very strong recommendation to send an email so that you have it in, in writing, the issue you were having, but also call to get through it quickly. And don't wait until the final uh, deadline day either to do so. And that's the next general point. Um, don't create a proposal on the, the deadline day of the call. I mean, do it do it weeks before, even months before. Even if you're working on your proposal outside the tool, please create the program in the, uh, sorry, create the proposal in the tool already. Because what you don't want to find is that you have technical issues at the very last moment and no time to solve them. Okay, now I need to push on because I've only got 20 more minutes. If you've used the, um, we call it the SEP submission tool, if you've used it before, then you will be offered the picks that you've used, okay? So these are ones I use in the course of uh, internal testing. This is my own test pick, for instance. If you don't see it there, you can search for your organization and you can put in a free text search. So I can search for my, for instance, organization here as well. In fact, I have two and I'm going to use that one. If you don't find your organization or if you get too many results, you can either refine the search, it works like Google, or you can see more, more results here on the complete list. You see the first nine on the screen, you can see up to 200 on the complete list. If you haven't used the tool before and you know you haven't got a pick, you can register a pick here. I won't go through the process. It's very, very light. It's very fast. It takes two to three minutes because we only ask basic information at this stage in the process. We don't ask for uploads of accounts and company deeds and so on. This is only provided later in the process should you be invited to start forming a grant agreement. So I'm going to use my test company and you see it puts the information in here you then identify yourself as a main contact or a contact person normally speaking you would be the main contact but in the case of some large organizations it can be that a contact person creates a proposal uh, and then passes the main contact on to somebody senior for the final submit event you need to give an acronym and a short summary which is also known as an abstract in the uh, in the research world It will tell you that the organization you've chosen will receive a notification that a proposal has been created in their name. That's to stop people abusing the, the system, of course. And then you have a general uh, terms and conditions. If you, if you cancel this, you cannot create the proposal. So essentially you need to accept it. And then you have the um, possibility, some of this information is available before the submission deadline to the commission officials to help them, particularly for instance, to choose um, experts, external experts, and try and avoid conflicts of interest. If you're worried that this information might be abused, you can have it um, obfuscated. But we, we prefer that you don't because it's useful for some core coordinations. You click OK, and it creates the proposal. And then it puts you onto the consortium step. So we choose at this moment to continue with the proposal. And then we're on to participants where you can build your consortium. You see the screen looks the same everywhere else except for the content on the right-hand side. Now, I'm gonna go out of this proposal now because I created one previously with some content in it, so we will save time, okay? So I'm just gonna close the browser tab and I'm back in the funding and tenders portal and I can refresh the screen. And then in my areas, you see, I have a my proposals section. Obviously I've got quite a bit because I play around with the, the tools quite a lot. And I want to find back, not only the proposal we just created, but the proposal I created uh, yesterday. The easy way to find the most recent proposal is to sort on the proposal ID, because then you'll get the highest proposal ID number coming out first. This is the one we just created, okay? And this is one I created earlier. So then you can go over to the actions and you can edit the, the draft proposal. You can also delete it. If you've created one, you don't want to go any further, you can delete it. But obviously we're going to edit the draft. 
Now, this actually puts you into the edit uh, proposal screen, but we're going to go back to the participant screen. So you have a bit of a tram line along the top. It's a little bit of a linear process, but when you get to the submit event, you can you can loop between the participant and the proposal forms as many times as you like. And here's another interesting point. With it being an electronic submission tool, you can resubmit the same proposal as many times as you like prior to the call deadline. So there's the next recommendation. Get a proposal into the system, a good first version of your proposal, and submit it. So you've already got one in the bag. So if something disastrous happens between then and the deadline of the call, you do have a proposal submitted you can come back to that proposal and you can refine it later as many times as you like and resubmit it. It only ever takes the last submitted proposal. And you can change the participant uh, list, the um, consortium, at any moment as well. So here I've created a simple consortium, but you can see the call requires at least three participants from different EU member states and associated countries. And currently I only have one. Now, this does not stop you submitting the proposal, but in this case, it would probably mean that you would fail the eligibility check um, after the call deadline. So clearly you would want to build a consortium that satisfies three participants from different EU member states. Now, I'm gonna add a participant. You can also add associated partners, but for the purposes of this, I will just add a partner. And I will add another test company I'm aware of. Oops. Okay, and this one's from Poland. And then you see it asks you to provide some contact details. Now, every a participating organization needs a main contact. You have to have a main contact. If you don't have a main contact, it will block the submission. So normally the first contact you will add would be the main, okay? and they have full access rights to the proposal. What does that mean? It means when you enter the email information, so let's enter this, and I'll talk about it some more. This is actually a fake email address. Doesn't matter for the purposes of this, but a notification will be sent to this email address and they will be invited to join the proposal. So it's a collaborative process. I got the impression from hearing some of the questions uh, that were put to Olivier that a lot of you are already familiar with the tool and you understand this, okay? So the person is invited to the proposal. They will see the proposal when they go to the funding and tenders portal and log in with the EU login that's associated with this email address. And they will be able to join the proposal from the My Proposals tab, just the same way that you saw it as the core coordinator or the proposal coordinator rather. So we add that contact. Now I'm gonna try and speed up and talking way too much. And great. You still have 10 minutes. So. Yeah. It's hanging on me. Okay. I'm going to bomb out of that because we're short on time. Um, and I'm going to do save and go to the next step. So we've added another partner and now it's complaining because we didn't add a main contact. Well, that's we're going to ignore that for the moment because we won't have time to resolve that in the, the confines of this demo. Okay. Now we're back at the proposal form stage. Now for the proposal forms, we've got two main sections. We've got the administrative forms part A, and then we've got the part B and annexes. So the administrative form is a web form where you fill in actual data. That's data that flows to other IT systems. The part Bs are constructed from templates, which you download here. If I click on that, I won't do it here because we're again a bit short of time. It will download a zip file and within that zip file, you will get templates that you need to complete and save usually as PDF documents to upload here. So the part B is the main proposal proper itself. For this call, you've got clinical studies annex. So if, you're, if your proposal re 
requires or has some clinical studies, you would upload the details here. And with it being a cancer-based uh, proposal, it's possible it has some ethics issues, uh, which you need to define in the in the form, the Part A form. We'll look at that in a moment. And then you would need to elaborate in an ethics annex. But what you see here is for the Part B, you have a red line. And for the ethics, you have a green line. That means that the green is an optional annex. You don't need to upload it. The red is a mandatory annex. You do need to upload something. And if you click here on the question mark, it will tell you the constraints. So it's mandatory attachment, it's a PDF, and a maximum of 10 megabytes, and a maximum number of pages of 45. What does that mean? It means if you upload a proposal with 46 pages, the page 46 will be blanked. It will not be readable by the experts during the evaluation. So please, in the case of this topic, only upload a maximum of 45 pages in your main proposal. So we're going to already upload a document here because if you have a missing mandatory attachment, you will not be able to um, submit the proposal. And here I'm just taking a PDF. And there it is, it's uploaded. Now, if you are a partner on this call, you cannot upload or delete these documents, but you can view them and you can download them. Okay, it's a collaborative process. The information is shared. So um, contacts who are invited into the proposal from participating organizations will see this information. Be aware on that. Now the part A, if we click on edit forms. It will open up a new browser tab. And then we see the administrative form. So we have a header page and a table of contents. And essentially you need to work your way through all of these in order to uh, complete all the data, okay? So we just go through it sequentially. You've got general information, it's rather high level, proposal title, duration. In this case, you've got some fixed keywords, okay? So look at the keywords list and please choose keywords that relate directly to your proposal, okay? You can add up to five, I believe. You can add some free keywords, an abstract, which is a, a more in-depth uh, explanation, a summary of the, of the proposal itself. Did you submit a previous proposal in the last two years to any EU, EU program? And please put the proposal ID here. And then you have some boilerplate declarations, okay? And here you'll see we've got two levels of uh, colors showing here. Again, it's, the, it's a yellow, meaning it's a warning message like the warning message we had on the consortium and red meaning it's blocking. So in this case, you have to check that you have the explicit consent of all applicants. This is this is the rules of um, participation anyway. So obviously you will have, or you would, wouldn't have put them in the uh, consortium. And normally you would be expected to check the rest of these as well. Obviously you will read them when you create the proposal yourself. This is not the formal declaration of honor. It's just a first pass at this stage. Then we have the participants and contacts. So these are the three I created before, and Yanitom is the one I added. If you add or remove a participant in the in the um, in the previous screen, then you need to revisit the Part A form for two reasons. First of all, to complete the participant details. So we'll have a look at this one here. And I'm trying to go very, very fast on this, so apologies. Um, it's some basic information that's not available um, from the PIC. Okay, so the PIC asks for very straightforward, simple in information that we don't always have everything we want. So we add some more here, but in this case, I'm gonna go very fast and say there's no department involved. And I'm gonna say, okay, it's Mr. It's, it's Mr. There's no actual details here because it, it didn't allow us to enter the um, participant, but normally you would see the first name, the last name and the email. And if this is wrong here, you need to change it in the consortium. You can't change it in the form. So that's another point to note. If you need to change the main contact, you don't change it in the part A form. You always go back to the consortium in the participant screen, okay? And any changes that you make there, you need to come back to the part A form at least to check and say, re-save it, okay? 
What I'm actually going to do um, is probably delete this participant. So I'm not going to complete the information, again, for a matter of time. But you see, you need to go through and fill it in. You need to add all your main researchers involved in the proposal. This is a new section um, under Horizon Europe. OK, also the administrative form section is new. So the role of the organization in the project. Oops, apologies. And then this information too on publications and projects and activities is also new along with the gender equality plan. So maybe you've applied for um, uh, funding under Horizon 2020 in the past, but be aware that these new sections are here and don't be surprised to see them. Okay, and this is completed for every participant. Now quickly to the budget. Budget table, yes, it's very similar to what you may have seen in the past under Horizon 2020. It's a little bit different. Uh, there's a few more columns. Uh, the income part is, uh, I think, new uh, compared to what you may have seen before. The same rules apply. Um, it's a high level summary budget per organization. Okay, so we, you see, I already put some budget in for the first three, but for the final organization, I did not. And then again, you see, we have a warning message here because I'm requesting a higher EU contribution than the maximum EU contribution. So the maximum EU contribution is calculated from the cost entered. And normally you cannot request more. It doesn't block, but it gives a warning. Okay. I'm going to leave that there. Note that the total amount is the same, but on the participant level, it's not. Next, we have the ethics. So again, those of you who've used the tool under Horizon 2020, you'll be aware that we have the ethics uh, questionnaire. It's um, it's a little bit changed. It's a little bit expanded. Uh, if you have anything in your proposal that has any of these uh, ethical issues, you need to indicate in here that yes or no and the page number where you can find it in the proposal. So the uh, ethics experts can find the information uh, more easy. And then you need to click the self-declaration. Uh, you need to give some more information for an ethics self-assessment. So you would enter some content here. And then what is new is that we have some questions, some security questions. These are questions that were in, included on some uh, calls under Horizon 2020, but they're now standard for all Horizon Europe programs. OK, so you need to complete these, even if it's all no, you need to pass through it. And then we have the other questions, which may or may not be uh, relevant. So here in this case, it's essential information in, on the clinical trials. And obviously, if you've added something here, then you would expect to upload a clinical trials annex. OK, so I just added one line. You can add another one. But if it's blank, it will give a, a warning message. So I remove it. And then we can click on the validation result. And then you see we have two levels of validation. We have error and a warning. An error will not allow you to submit. A warning will allow you to submit. So you have to clear the errors, OK? Um, but you don't have to clear the warnings. In this case, we haven't uh, put any information on this one applicant. So if you click on it, it will take you to that participant. OK. And it's in this. I'm going to just put in some stuff to get us through as we're running out of time. That should be enough. And validate the form again. So you see that error message is now gone. We've still got them for uh, Tomasz Janisz, but I'm going to get rid of him. So we can save and exit the form. Again, you can save and exit the form and come back to it whenever you wish, obviously. I don't know why we could land the main contact uh, details. That's just a little glitch. Maybe it's OK now, but I've got 30 seconds left, so I'm going to. OK, so we've got our part A completed. We've got our annexes uploaded, but I'm going back to the participants list. So you see, you can edit this whenever you want. I'm going to trash that participant. So he's gone. OK, save and go to next step. You always need to save any changes 
that you've made in this screen because they're stored locally on your on your PC, on your Mac, or on your your Windows PC, or on your iPad, or whatever you use. The tool works almost on any device. Okay. Now we can do a submit. No, sorry, I'm wrong. I changed the consortium, so I must edit the forms. I'm not listening to myself. I also realize it's getting dark in my room here and I don't have a light on. So apologies. And uh, let's see. Let's go to the participants. Okay, he's gone. We can save and exit the form. And time's up, Dave. Yeah. I'm nearly done. And we can submit. As you see, it says we have some uh, budget warnings. Okay, we're aware of that. We don't have any others, it's okay. You can open up the budget warnings and indeed the re requested contribution was higher than the max EU contribution. If you remember, it's complaining about Tommy Gianni still probably because we didn't revisit the budget uh, screen, but uh, uh, you can put an explanation of why you have some, some warnings if you wish. And that proposal is submitted. And then you come to the submission screen and then you receive a real proposal ID and that would become a project ID if your proposal was to go forward uh, into the granting process. From here, you can update the proposal. You can withdraw the proposal. You can download the uh, signed combined um, e-receipt as uh, was mentioned by Olivier. It takes some time uh, to, to generate, but it will become available. And then you can go out of the tool as you wish. But of course, at any moment in time, you can come back via the My Proposal screen. So again, the quick way to find it, do it on Proposal ID. Ah, yes, of course. It has changed from a from this to the other type. So then you can do a filter instead, answer, and you see this is this one with a temporary ID, and here we have one with a final ID. And then you can go back in and you can view the submitted at any moment prior to the deadline, and you can go back to updating the proposal again. So again, don't fear. Um, you can revisit it as much as you like, submit it as much as you like, uh, change the consortium, change the documents, and so on and so forth. Okay, that was it. Time because we have a few questions. Great. Thanks, I think that was very helpful um, for many people, including myself. I've never seen it from that perspective, to be honest. So, first question, what is the difference between adding an associated partner and a partner? What is the difference? That's a difficult question for a guy from the IT side. It's um, probably Isabel would answer, but she's yeah, she had it's, to it's, leave. I don't, associated partners need a pick, um, but they don't they don't sign anything in the grant agreement. Um, sorry, I have to move out of this current room because my son has a piano lesson. Um, I'm going yeah. No, can we can we come back on that and give a written okay. response? Is that the possible? main difference? I think the main. I don't know from the submission side, but the main difference is, of course, that associate partners will not need to sign the grant agreement, and of course, yes, they cannot correct. request funding. So, I, I'm not sure if the, if you don't put if they don't put funding request, then it's automatically associated partners. Something. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think in the grant in the um, budget table, it's a fairly new thing to be in the yeah, in the structured new. form. Yeah, and don't I think worry, the we will move them later if it. needed to the right position during the grant agreement preparation phase. So, can you change the order of the participants in the forms? Seems not to be at this, possible. At this at this stage, I believe there's an issue that it can't be done. Um, it was the case um, with the previous uh, tool. In fact, the tool is the same. But the screens were changed, uh, the, the look and feel was changed. And since that happened, there's been an issue with it. I know that the development team are working on this, but I don't think it's yet. I can try it, actually. I don't really well, see a reason why it would be important, actually. 
important who is the coordinator to know, but for the rest, they all yeah, it doesn't it, it's not working. But you can you can yeah normally you you can drag you used to be able to drag and drop them, and you could change the coordinator like that indeed. And I think in some cases, if you have a very large consortium, I think there's a certain uh, validity to being higher up it if you're a more distinguished. Uh, participant, I think. But uh, other than that, I wouldn't know the reason to do it. That's not really a distinction. <laughs> um, how long prior to a deadline does an organization need to apply for a pick? I do, it can be done on the fly. Um, it just takes a few it, minutes. It, yeah. it really takes uh, two to three minutes. Uh, but honestly, you wouldn't want to be creating a, an organization two to three minutes prior to the call deadline. So please always give plenty of time prior. And this preliminary pick numbers, does this still exist? The same system. A, a, pick, a pick is a pick. As soon Nothing as you've created changed. one, it, it remains as it's is. Until, preliminary and until the entity is, is validated, right? Yeah. Which only yeah, happens correct. normally once it's suggested for funding. Correct. How to update information how to update information for an organization already having a pick and a successful then, proposal? Yeah then the, uh, the organization Leah has access to, to do that. If, if, you, as, if you as a um, proposal coordinator see an issue with the um, organization you've added, then if you see here on the participant screen, you've got a contact organization button. And if you click on that, it will take you to a web screen where you can type a message and this will be received by the Leah of the organization, but what it doesn't do is reveal who is the leader of the organization for privacy reasons. So contact the leader and then it can be updated. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you need to assign roles, leader coordinator, before you can start working on the proposal? No. When you insert a partner to an application, will there be a notification mail sent to the organization? Yes, yes. Exactly. They should know um, how to update information for an organization already having a pick. No, this we had already. Yeah. Maybe the, the ask also about following last, and uh, usually it's uh, almost uh, instant. So it was good to go in my area, my organizations, and change the information there. Yeah. So, for instance, if you go here, my organizations, that's all the ones I've, I've basically used. And then here, for instance, we don't see your screen. I have, I have, I have. Your screen. Ah, strange. No, we don't see. Yep. No, listen. So I can modify. Okay. I've got an error message. Great. It, it's possible now they could be doing changes on the IT because it's after the call deadline moment. So they do these things after the business hours. So, okay. But normally, yes, you go here. Um, my organizations, and then your organization will come, and then you go on actions, and then modify organization, edit organization roles. So it's all managed here by the leader of the organization. The account administrator. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if we have to finish sharp because it's 35. I think that we have only have two questions. So two questions left. Is there an example template for part A? Yes. Yes, it's published on the topic page. In the topic page together with part B. While the print preview shows the complete application, including part B and other attachments, will the print preview? Um, at the moment, the print preview is showing the part A. If you want the full proposal, then you would need to do a submit and then get the e receipt. Okay, you submit, which is anyway not a bad idea. Yeah, indeed. Is it necessary to fill the ethics in two-stage proposals in an A form? It's not possible, but during validate, there's an error resulting in a blocking issue. I'm not sure there are other, I'm not sure there are ethics in the first stage. Um, that would be a new thing if there was. I must admit I haven't been in the loop of such mm -hmm. a discussion. Can we answer that one offline? Yeah. Okay, I, I also would think that in a first stage proposal you don't have the ethics, but if mm -hmm. um, offline means, so if you have any further questions, I think Olivier showed you where you can find more information.
the help desk, uh, the research inquiry service for the content, for technical issues, contact the help desk. There's a very good online uh, help, right? Mm -hmm. Which really, I think, is, is really helpful. So please look into this. Um, you will find probably most answers or answers to most of your questions. So with this, we close. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to the speakers. I, I think that was very nice presentations. And thanks for you for listening and for asking a lot of good questions. I hope that was you, we answered them well and you, you are now really looking forward to write and submit a proposal. We have already a lot from Dave, but um, <laughs> you, <laughs> you want... I will, I will remove them, don't worry. <laughs> You hopefully will remove them and we will get some with some more meaningful content. Sorry, Dave. And uh, with look forward to the first call of the missions. So thanks a lot and join us again tomorrow. We have the, the mission sessions on climate at 9 sharp um, and see you back there. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>